Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're going to talk about uh, non-metallic metal effects on axes. Things that have an unusual shape like an axe. Um, this is the axe to Celesque, specifically to the Demon Prince, and it's such an interesting shape that I thought this would be a great opportunity for a hobby cheating video, because we've talked before about doing these kind of effects on swords, but we've never really talked about them on a shape like this, which is so unusual. Now obviously it's four, you have four different faces effectively, one, two, three, four, we're not going to do all of them on camera, I'll just basically focus on one side here, and then we'll, we'll go from there. There's no golden rule to things like weapons of exactly how light is going to reflect. So we have to set up our scheme and it has to adhere to everything else we've said about where light is coming from. Now on the rest of this miniature, I know light is coming down like this, at this direction. So when we look at that and think about that, what that means is that light would gather here on this flat that's exposed. And then it would pass over. This would be in shadow because it's the shadow nearest the light point. It would hit the ground and reflect back up. And my reflected light point is going to be here and here, so kind of in these spaces, and then pass out to a middle to a shadow here, and this will be shadow again. So light to shadow, light to shadow, mid, mid, shadow, light. You'll see. Um, let's talk about colors. In this case, I'm going to make this weapon very, very blue because I want it to look very magical, but you could apply the same exact things I'm going to talk about and show you uh, to any color of weapon. If you were going for just traditional steel, you know, anything can look non-metallic. It's really just about the contrast of running from extreme dark to extreme light. So I have a selection of colors on my palette here. Um, in my blue tones, I have some scale color Holdra blue and scale color Adriatic blue. Um, Holdra blue being very popular. I have a pop color here of um, Caribbean blue, although it's obviously very green. Uh, I have some white and some royal purple, the white being bold titanium white from Pro Acryl, a wonderful white paint. Uh, I'm gonna, I would also use some white, I'll use some white ink and stuff like that later for things like edges, um, as well as royal purple from Vallejo, which is a really nice rich purple tone for some shadows. We've got some Dollar Rowney FW Payne's Gray, which is a nice blue-black ink. So, and we've got a nice big sharp brush to do this work with, nice big size six nonsense brush. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna start by just placing in all of our light effectively as I just described it. And there's like this filigree in the blade that I'm just gonna ignore. I'm not even gonna pay attention to that. We'll, we'll handle that later. For right now, we're just gonna put everything in where it needs to be and start out by just sketching down what our colors look like here and getting them placed so we understand kind of the basic shapes of what we're dealing with. And the real key here is you want to make sure with this initial step the reason I sketch in this light first, before I really do anything else, is I want to make sure I like where all my lights are placed, okay? Because in the end, I have to make sure this all actually functions before I go and start putting in other glazes and working to refine the colors and stuff like that. So you notice I just took like some pure white and I made some highlights. I took my dark color, which is going to be a little bit of the Holdra plus a little bit of the purple plus a little bit of the panes. I sketched in some normal shadows, then I grabbed just the panes and sketched in some deeper shadows. Now I'm going to just start smoothing out between the two just slightly. We'll bring wheel back some of that white. Let's grab some of that. Add in a little bit of the Holdra. Bring back the edge there. Very quick and dirty process just to make sure that what we're working with here is actually going to give us the effect that we want. Okay? And then what we should be able to do is look at that and 
and sort of squint our eyes and see if the effect it gives us is what we want. Now, one thing you may have to do even at this early stage to make sure you're in the right place is maybe take some of your pure white, kind of work it off there. So we have just a small amount. And let's go ahead and, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna go ahead and hit this edge. Because oftentimes things like non-metallic effects are sold almost exclusively through the edging. And here I need to grab a much sharper brush for the middle line. I do have a little flow improver over on my palette as always off camera. And then what I'm going to do is very carefully, I probably apologize if I lean into the shot, I just need to see very closely. There we go. Trace that line. Okay. So now, when we squint our eyes and sort of look at that, the question is, do we have the effect we want? And I think the answer there is yes. Now, at this point though, the game just becomes like, that's our initial colors. That's it, we laid it down. So at this point, the name of the game, it just becomes refinement. That's it. Like, we know we like what our color pattern here looks like, and that's why I use these nice thick paints to lay this down. Because from here, then what I wanna do is just go in and start uh, you know, basically thinning out these colors uh, and working with what I've got to smooth everything out, make sure all my light runs against where it should, make sure my shadows run against where they should. You know, you just kind of refine, refine, refine the pattern through progressively sort of thinner paints. Now, if you're feeling real bold and saucy, Depending on how tight your control is in some places, you can certainly use an airbrush for this. Um, you don't have to do this solely through brush. These kinds of glazes can absolutely be done through the airbrush as well, if you feel like you're a surgeon with your airbrush, which you certainly might be. The key is just to keep it thin, make sure you shoot at the right angles, but it's certainly possible. Um, but if you don't want to have, if you're, if you're not quite at that level of comfort with your your airbrush, that's no problem. You can always just get your normal brush out, and as you can see, as I'm doing here, just balance out those shadows. And then what we're going to do is play with how big we make the shadows, where we push the tones. Effectively, this is a lot of just fighting back and forth on the colors until I like how big everything is. So like, do I have enough shadow? Do I have enough light? Do I need to work darker shadows into some places? All right, that's all it, at this point, just a refinement game. That's all it is. Do I have enough actual bright white there in the middle? That kind of thing. So like here at this point, this should be my brightest point of the blade. It should be wide to match the shape and then coming in thinner, right? So in other words, it should go like from here down to here. Something like that. This part can be more or less like that. And this part can be like that. And yeah, I'll be covering up my edges here some, by the by, like as I'm doing this, and that's perfectly okay. The key with the ax shape is just, you still take the same lessons from the sword. And that is to say, you think about, are you heating what the light is doing and are you matching up that expectation? Is the light sort of behaving as we would expect it to, given where we've said the light source is? And this is one of those things I think people give a lot of, it sort of gives people a lot of consternation, right? Because they feel like, well, I don't know where I should really place it. The key is, don't worry about it. Just get some paint down and, and look at it. Your eyes will tell you if you've placed it in the right at the right point as you're kind of looking at the reflection and as you see it evolve through uh, through these evolving glazes. Like the reality is it will slowly come together for you to where you look at it and say, oh yeah, okay, that's in the right place. Right? 
And the more you keep doing this back and forth, the more smooth every transition becomes. Um, don't worry about working with kind of, you know, paint over paint. You have to be a little careful. You want to have a light touch. But in general, you see how I keep moving around the blade? When you're working in ultra thin glazes like this, everything dries in a matter of seconds. So like there should be no reason why you ever have to, you know, wait for anything to dry or go get out a hair dryer or anything like that. Just, just keep working it down, moving your way around. Every so often, let it set completely. Take a look at it, step back, and see if it's really, uh, see if it's really selling. Right? Like, are you buying the, the color transitions? Are you believing sort of the, the, the shade to the reflection point seem to be capturing in the right place. And the reason it's good to let everything kind of dry every so often is just because you see how many times I've kept going back to my well of white where I kind of go to my highest color. And that's because white, when you first put it down, looks very bright. Without any additional work, that white is going to fade. Because when white is wet, it is naturally much brighter. That's just the nature of all white paint, right? Like white is simply brighter when it is wet because it is glossy and hence it is reflecting light. When it dries, it becomes more matte. It is less, uh, it is less bright. So one needs to be aware of that and be thinking about that when you're sort of doing your transitions. So I'm going to sit here and keep doing this for a while <laughs> but I'm not done yet we're gonna come back in what'll be just a second for you and probably be longer for me <laughs> uh, because I want to talk about one of the most important elements to selling effects like this which is the inclusion of pop colors so at this point it's just gonna be a lot of the same thing I'm doing right now see how I'm just glazing this back and forth I'll work on probably the other axe head and uh, we'll be back in just a moment. All right, we're back. You can see our X was all ready to go. It's shiny. I did the other side too, uh, just so it looked better on camera. That's what we started from. That's where we ended at. And all of this is just me doing more of exactly what uh, you saw me do on camera for you know six or seven minutes. If you're curious, this is about another let's say 30 minutes of doing that, maybe 25, something like that, okay? I'll admit, it's not a quick process. <laughs> um, but I think it's worth it because I think it looks pretty cool. Now, just some quick notes on other things here we want to keep in mind. Whenever you have, you want to break up your, your light in some way. Now, fortunately, this axe has these little divots here. So that let me go ahead and make those dark. And then what we want to do as well is make sure that we have a little bit of light. And what we want to do is very carefully Sorry, I had to hold my breath there very carefully get those the bottoms of those with that light. Now I'm only hitting the side where the reflection is coming from. I'm not doing, I'm not outlining the whole thing, okay? Uh, because that would be overkill. So the last thing I wanna talk about here, because really I hope that the lesson here with the axe is, is you notice how on this side I alternated the light? Like here, the light is in the center of the blade and down here and it's opposed by the shadow and so on and so forth, right? And then I have a moderate color here kind of in the middle and I pushed a light up here toward the top. In other words, I alternated side to side. It's not always going to be the case, but it's often a good rule of thumb to follow because it just naturally creates that balance and visual interest. The last thing I want to talk about with just non-metallic metal in general uh, is pop color. You'll notice I have my this greenish tone and I haven't touched it yet. But we're going we're gonna to get into it now. So I'm going to take this, this teal color here, or whatever it is, sort of blue-green, seafoam green, I guess is what we'd call it. We're going to thin it out a little, or a lot, actually. 
I'm going to thin it way down. Now this is a color I really like for this purpose, tested on the back of my hand. You can see that's how much it's covering there, not much at all. And then what we're going to do is here between our white and our, and our blue color, we're going to glaze that in. Notice my brush is moving. I'm starting over the white and just bringing a real slight glaze of that down. Real slight. Test it every time. Because this is some really, really light touch work here. Now, the reality is there's probably no way you're going to see any real difference on camera, okay, with what I'm doing here. Because it's just too subtle. But, here's what I will tell you. This is one of the most worthwhile steps you can do with your non-metallic metal. You don't have to, I happen to be using green here, which is really nice when you're doing these heavy blue tones. But you can use anything. Uh, so like if you're doing traditional steel, this is a great place to work. Your pop color could be blue itself, as opposed to you know, this very blue axe. If you're doing, uh, it could also be something like a slight yellow tone or a sepia tone to have some brown color in there. Those very slight additions, and again, I don't think that changed on camera at all, but I assure you here in reality, I can see a difference. It just enriches the tone. I use a little bit of that color here for the same reason I use a little bit of purple in the shadows. Because you can just see that slight purple tone when I rotate the shadow. And a slight light, like a, a, a slight addition of a color even when it's extremely minimal, is always going to be more interesting than not, than its absence. Because when we're just dealing with white or black, they're the most boring colors because they communicate the least visual information. So when we have other colors worked into it, when we add additional visual interest by having that, sorry, I'm just smoothing out that white blend just a little bit, um, when we add additional visual interest through the minor additions of those color, we really, like, your brain just notices that it looks more interesting. Pop colors are something I want to go into probably in a whole future video, but it was really, really relevant here. One of the things that can make non-metallic really sell is when you have these interference colors, these light pollution, these additions of other colors. Somebody like Lan uses this really well. Right. His, if you look at his non-metallics that he, do, he does, which are just jaw-dropping, but when you look at them, you'll notice he always has other colors in there, too. It's not just like if he's doing steel. It's never just flat white to flat black. There's always interference colors of, of slight yellows and browns and greens and just other things in the environment to make it more visually interesting. So, there you go. That's kind of how you want to think about non-metallic axes. Think about where your light source is and set it up much the same way you would a sword. Oppose the darkest spots of the, the blade with the lightest parts of the blade. You can do the same trick if the axe is standing straight up, like this, right, and the light was coming straight down, then you could have light here, and, in the, and you know, it could be reflecting back up at the bottom here. You could have this dark and this dark, and then kind of a middle tone, you know, a light kind of caught in the middle there, but maybe it's not as strong. So no matter how you rotate this thing around, there's always still you just want to kind of follow that guideline. It's again, the rules are more like guidelines. Uh, but you know, you want to stick to it because it's just a good rule of thumb and then you can play from there. All right. Do the rule first, then break it. <laughs> but at any rate, that's non-metallic axes. Uh, give it a like if you like it. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. We have new videos here every Saturday. Uh, if you want to take a class with me, I have my teaching schedule down below and a couple different links. I'd love to see you at a class. Uh, if you have things you'd like to see me cover in future hobby cheating videos, feel free to drop that down in the comments. Always love suggestions on future videos. But as always, I very much appreciate you watching this one, and we'll see you next time.